I work for the government, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. We are actually the technical arm of the Ministry, Wildlife Institute of India. Primary role is to train forest officers in managing national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. We also do research, and uh, I'm an academician. Um, the criteria of judging academicians is how many scientific papers you produce, how many grants you raise, but when your research actually gets translated into conservation actions, it is like Soneme Suhaga. And I'm going to tell you how science has been used in wildlife conservation in India and how research has actually guided policy and management in our country. Scientists don't even know how many species exist on this planet. The estimate is anywhere between 10 to 30 million, but it's a guesstimate, we don't know that. Just like birth and death, evolution and extinction are the two sides of the same coin. Any species which evolves is bound to become extinct. Today, after the loss of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we have again in the Anthropocene reached an extinction crisis. The background levels of extinction have been increased 100 to 300 fold. And this is because there is a single species that evolved on this planet about two million years ago, us. Luckily for us, we humans were also endowed with the intellect by nature to redress the negative actions of us on this planet. We can do that if some of us realize it and act towards solving this problem. In India, the first humans appeared about a million years ago. It is only within the last 40,000 years when humans learned to use fire that we changed the habitat to make it more conducive for ourselves and less and less conducive for our conspecifics, the biodiversity of this planet, which started declining because of us. But it is in the last 2,000 years when we established civilizations that our impact has escalated to a global extinction crisis. And some of our jobs, like the one I do, is to prevent this extinction because of which is caused by anthropogenic means. India shares a huge amount of biodiversity compared to its geographical area and the population pressures that we face. We still have a lot of animals and plants, microbes, organisms which you deal with on our area of the planet compared to the other parts of the world. And this has survived on our planet primarily because of the religious and cultural attitudes of our people towards nature. In the Western world, usually the Western religions, the Abrahamic religions with no offense to any religion, talk about humans as being dominion of nature. We conquer nature for its use. The Eastern religions of Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism talk about custodianship of nature. And this basic difference has allowed nature to persist on our part of the world compared to the other parts of the world. It's not because of the forest department or scientists or managers who've done this, but it is the people of India who have conserved nature for millennia. However, our attitudes and values are fast changing. The population pressures on this planet are fast changing, um, and that creates a crisis for our area. When we have 1.3 billion people living in India, the pressures are humongous. The GDP which we maintain, the development which we do, is all impinging on the human footprint which are creating in our part of the world. It was not only the ethics of conservation, but when the world was a barbaric part in the western side, we actually indoctrinated the principles into policy and law. And the first policy on nature conservation can be seen by in the Arthashastra of Chanakya. The Yellowstone National Park is considered to be the first national park in the world, 1857 or something like that. But during the time of Ashoka, we had Abhayaranyas in our country about 400 BC. So India has been a leader in conservation and we take this leadership in the modern era as well. When I started work with tigers, that was in 2002, I had been um, uh, working with lions and other, other carnivores initially. But in 2002, I was asked by the ministry to help them assess tiger populations across the country. And that point in time, we were going through a crisis in tiger conservation. We had lost two tiger 
tigers in two tiger reserves, Sariska and Panna. The Prime Minister had formed a tiger task force. And one of the major limiting factors in tiger conservation was false numbers of our populations. Now, counting wildlife is like counting crows um, in Delhi. And if you remember the famous episode where Akbar asks Birbal that how many crows are there in Delhi, Birbal very bitterly answered that it's like close to be about 10 lakh crows in uh, Delhi. So Akbar was surprised. He asked, how is it possible that you know this? He says, sir, just count them. He says, you know it's impossible to count crows. He says, you count them and you'll find them to be about 10 lakhs. What if there are more? He says, oh, the neighboring villages, you know, the crows are visiting their relatives in Delhi and that's why the number is more. What if the number is less? The crows from Delhi are visiting the relatives outside. So it is a, you know, it's a no-win situation. You can, you can say anything you like. And at that point in time, we had a population estimate of about 3,500 tigers in India, official record. When we did this with the scientific method, we found that there were only around 1,400 tigers left in our country. And this shook the entire policy of the government of India and the subsequent research which came through with our work was actually uh, changed the Wildlife Protection Act. It was enacted in the parliament and the act was amended and a lot of reforms took place. Now the question is how do we do this? Just like you have fingerprinting for humans, we fingerprint tigers based on their stripe patterns. Each tiger has a unique stripe pattern. So if they take selfies of themselves when they walk on forest trails with remote cameras, you can use this information in counting tigers. But there are problems associated with that. Tiger doesn't you know, give a very nice selfie, it you know, may give you a side profile, front profile, and you don't always get the fingerprint right. So you have to have computer models which correct for pitch and roll, and artificial intelligence which allows you to compare one tiger from another because it's humanly impossible to do that. We also use this information to fight tiger crime. For example, this skin which was seized in, um, I don't know if this shows up here, no it doesn't, but if you can see the skin here which was seized in Kathmandu, um, it was traced, you know, you could trace it to a tiger in Pench Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh where the live tiger was photo captured. So maintain a repository at the Wildlife Institute of India and you can get to the hot spots of poaching and address those because you know where the tiger crime is coming from. So as um, Dr. Mehta mentioned, uh, this survey, the last survey which was done, not by me, but I was, I'm the lead scientist on that, it was done by the forest department of all the tiger states along with the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Uh, we got the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest wildlife survey connect, conducted on this planet. And you can see the effort which is put in. About 44,000 people working across the country, about 5 lakh kilometers of walk. Um, we covered an area of about 33.8 lakh square kilometers. Uh, and we found that tigers occupied about 88,000 square kilometers. So each blue dot which you see on this map of India is a trail which is walked by a forest guard and whenever he sees a tiger sign, either it's a pug mark of a tiger or a fecal matter of a tiger, it's marked in red. So you can get a distribution map of the tiger itself. And this, then we go in and put camera traps and we take photographs of all wildlife. So the tiger census actually helps in assessing the entire biodiversity of a forested area in the country. Now I'll just give you a small brief because it's a scientific talk. Oh, that's, thanks a lot, but I, need, I don't need this, so thank you. Ah, this is much better off. So this is, I'll just explain to you how this technique works. And uh, this is a map of India, which shows you where the tigers are, the population extent. I'll just concentrate on this part of the Tarai, the foothills of the Himalayas where the tiger population is. And uh, if you see this, this, this green swiggles each represents a walk by the forest guard. It's about five kilometer walk, and it covers the entire area in which tigers are found in the Tarai landscape. So this is Uttarakhand, this is Corbett Tiger Reserve, uh, this is Pilibhit and Dudhwa over here, this is Bihar, Valmiki. So you can see the extent right from Uttarakhand all the way to Bihar. And this area is Nepal. So just to orient you, after that, once you know this, we find out where the tiger signs are. So these red dots tell you where the tiger signs are. Subsequently, we put camera traps, so about 3,500 cameras, remote cameras are deployed in this area, and we photograph tigers. Okay? So we photographed about 598 tigers based on their unique stripe patterns. But mind you, not all tigers like to be photographed. They may not come in front of the camera. So there is an issue of detection. 
Okay. So need to be addressed through statistical models. And also you can't deploy cameras across where the tigers are found because cameras are expensive, they get stolen, and so on and so forth. So they, that all needs to be accounted for. And after accounting for detection probability, that is tigers not appearing in front of the camera, we develop statistical models which allow you to predict the tiger numbers in an area with a reasonable level of certainty based on statistical confidence limits. So the model here, we look at tiger sign, Wherever tiger sign increases, that means more encounters of pug marks or scats, that is fecal matter. The tiger density increases. Wherever there's more human disturbance, tigers decline. And wherever there's more food in the form of prey, again, tiger populations increase. So this gives you a tiger estimate of this area. Now, this uh, was actually telecast on National Geographic, made a nice film. I hope this voice comes. I'll just stop this for a sec. Uh, you need to attach that. Sorry about that. When we use technology, it has its own glitches, but I think this should work. Yeah. 80% of the world's. It's just a teaser. Our loss in tiger population over the years. India, home to 70% of the world's tiger population, is turning the needle on the global tiger population. Every four years, the Indian government undertakes a count to check the health of the population of tigers. National Geographic brings you the story of India's national animal and the community of passionate officers involved in the biggest ever tiger head count. Tigers need protection, so if you have good protection regime and you have good food, Tigers bounce back. Celebrate the moment of hope, pride, and perseverance. Counting Tigers. Premieres 7th August, Wednesday, 8 p.m. on National Geographic and Hotstar. So this gave us a lot of global um, coverage. It was uh, screened in nine countries, and uh, it was wonderful. So see the efforts of the Indian government being portrayed across the world. Now this here is something which is familiar, may be familiar to you. This is using uh, microsatellites, uh, genetic markers. Each bar represents a tiger here. So there are about 156 tigers from across India. And we're looking at the population structure of tigers to tell us if there are any unique genetic populations which need special attention for conservation and are actually declining. So what you see is the northeastern tigers, which is in Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, and those areas are very different from the rest of the tigers. The Central Indian tigers are extremely diverse genetically because it's an amalgamation of South Indian tigers, which are also genetically unique and different. And this is an amalgamation zone having the maximum diversity. So we actually tell, advise the government that the priority should be given to this area where there is a very little representation, the tiger population is actually depressed, as well as in the southern western Ghats where the population are decreased. And this has been translated into the standard operating procedure by the government of India of where tigers should be artificially moved when you need to move them, mix them, and so on and so forth. The same work has been done with leopards. Dhol is the Indian wild dog, and you can see the genetic structure. The, dhol, the leopard, for example, doesn't have a structure at all, and it is all mixed population, and that's because the leopard can move across human habitations as well, unlike the tiger, which needs forested corridors to move from one area to the other. The dhol also, the population is extremely mixed, except for this population, which is from the Tarai area, northern area, and that, I believe, is because there are wild dogs present in the trans Himalayas, and it is gene flow from that direction as well. For snow leopard, found in the higher reaches of Ladakh and um, Sikkim and Himachal Pradesh, um, we use a different technique because, of course, the spots on the leopard are also unique to them. But because of the long fur and the wind, it's, you can misidentify them. The, the spots change from one photograph to another. So we developed a new technique of photographing the forehead and developing a model based on the markings on the forehead where the fur is short and the movement of the spots is not so much. But how do you get a leopard to actually give a selfie on its forehead? So we use an ingenious device, Kevin Klein perfume. The leopards just get inquisitive with this perfume and they go to investigate. So if you were to spray a little bit on the ground and then put a camera, you get a nice portrait of the snow leopard 
facing that and looking at it. And then we put transmitters on many of them, uh, satellite callers, which give you information of where their movements are and so on and so forth. And we use this to estimate their population, their habitat use and so on and so forth uh, across uh, the entire state of Ladakh. So again, this is the same thing what we do with tigers, and I will not beleaguer this uh, due to lack of time, but this is using sign surveys, occupancy surveys, subsequently with camera traps, and you can come up with an estimate of snow leopards um, across the Himalayan state, which is far more difficult. Looking at lions, this used to be the historical distribution of lions, and of course, as you know, lions are only found now in the state of Gujarat, in Saurashtra landscape, and the protected area of lions is this gear protected area, which consists of a national park and sanctuary. But in the last 15 years, lions have dispersed out of this protected area into a human-dominated landscape of about 30,000 square kilometers where they share space with people. So you can have lions living in your backyards, and the people of Saurashtra have learned to live with these animals, which are quite dangerous, actually. So how do we count the lions? Lions don't have body markings. Yeah? So they have, you can't take a photograph and identify one lion from another. So we devised an ingenious way of looking at their whiskers. Lions have spots on their whiskers, and these are unique to every lion. The probability of mixing up two lions is about one in 10,000. So we use this information in a software and then estimate their populations using models known as specially explicit mark recapture. The crux of the story is, Due to the human pressures in our country, the size of our protected areas are too small. Lions, for example, these are home ranges of lions. You can see they are much larger than the gear protected area. There are about 1,700 lions living in 13,000 square kilometers, not all of them within the legal realm of protected areas. Tigers, if you see, we have the world's largest tiger population. About 65% of the global tiger population is in India, and the largest populations of tigers in the world exist in these three landscapes, but most of them live outside of protected areas. The possibility of, you know, you can't fence our areas. Just like Kruger National Park, if some of you have gone on a safari to South Africa, you'll realize that 20,000 kilometers, square kilometers of Kruger is fenced with an electric fence. So they have a direct zonation where people and wildlife don't mix. They don't, they don't tolerate conflict at all. In our country, People live with wildlife, and that's the difference. And there are conflicts, and these conflicts need to be mitigated urgently. We cannot afford to fence our protected areas because they are just too small. We also need to estimate how many of these large carnivores can actually fit into our, in our reserves. And for that, you need to estimate something known as carrying capacity. How many animals, tigers, lions, can be fitted into, say, a national park? And this is directly based on a relationship between the density of prey and the density of tigers. You can see it's a pretty good fit, and this allows us to estimate where, how many animals can be fitted in. I'll just skip this. The second thing which we do is do something known as an insurance policy, but not for individuals, but for populations. It's a risk assessment of how long a population can persist in an area. It is known as a population viability analysis. And what we see here, are two different models. One is where a protected area, a national park, let's, for, let's say, for example, Taroba, which is close to you in Mumbai. Taroba has only 15 breeding tigers. And Melghat, for example, has 20 breeding tigers. The chances of extinction in the next 50 years is very high in Taroba, just because of sheer size of the population. This is estimated by knowing at the birth rate, the juvenile mortality, just like you do in insurance. Um, Interbirth intervals, uh, fecundity, survivorship of adults, and these are the population demographic parameters which are required, but you can actually predict the life of a population based on this. So this population viability analysis subsequently gets translated into the size and design of your nature reserves. For example, to sustain 20 breeding units, you need anywhere between 75 to 100 tigers in the core area of a tiger reserve, and together, the population is about 100 tigers, and that is viable for the long term. So this is part of the management planning for tiger reserves at the landscape scale. And, but how do you create space in a human population of 1.3 billion people for biodiversity? Because tigers act as an umbrella. They're at the apex of the food chain. So if you conserve the tiger, 
you're conserving the entire biota. It's not a single species conservation program, but more of a biodiversity conservation program. Because if you, you know, have the top part of your ecosystem functioning well, the rest of the ecosystem functions are going to be doing well as well. So our strategy is to create space in the core area by moving people out. Unfortunately, the legal system in India, you can, you know, we don't have right to property. It's not a fundamental right of Indians. You can evict people for creating a dam, industry, widening of roads, but you cannot evict people for conservation. Okay? That's the Forest Dwellers Act, or it's called the Forest Rights Act of 19, um, 2006. But you can't stop people from moving out if they want to move out voluntarily. So the Wildlife Protection Act gives an incentive of 15 lakh rupees per adult in the family to voluntarily move out of the core areas of a reserve. And this is the major strategy by the government of India to create space for wildlife. It is great for people as well because if you're living in the forest, you're conflicting with wildlife, they're eating your crops, they can kill your kids, uh, there's no education, there are no schools, there are no hospitals, no electricity, no marketplace to sell your products. But if you live outside, mainstreaming of society, then all this is available to you and it's a win-win situation. It's a great vote bank because the people are very happy. They're going to you know, give you votes. So the politicians love it, the people love it, and biodiversity loves it. So this is a strategy which is used by the government of India, which is not present anywhere in the world. So this is something which we need to be very proud of. So we are creating space for carnivores, for biodiversity as such. So what we want to do is have a landscape like this. This is a satellite view of central India. This is Kana Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh, Achana Kumar in Chhattisgarh, Pench again in Madhya Pradesh, Satpura land over here. And you can see this is the forested area. So if tigers can move across these forests from one tiger reserve to another, perfect. This is what you want to do where populations are linked. There is gene flow between these reserves. However, if you put just roadways on it, infrastructure, these forests are fragmented. And this, you have to move, tigers have to move across these barriers. So what we do is we model the optimal pathways which animals are likely to take using modern theory of circuitscape. It's just like current flow between the least pathway of resistance. And as you see, these yellow areas are the paths of movement between these tiger reserves. These pink areas are cities which are barriers. This is um, the city of Nagpur, the city of Jabalpur, and the highway number seven passing and cutting this corridor between Kana and Pench, forming a barrier to tiger movement. We see that genetics as well shows that actually tigers are moving across these landscapes, despite these barriers, but for how long? Especially when these roads become freeways with six laning, they will become barriers to gene flow. So the idea is then to create green infrastructure. So our research directly flows into showing mitigation strategies where you have India's first and the world's largest wildlife mitigation infrastructure on highway number seven, which connects Nagpur to Jabalpur. And under this highway, we have tigers crossing from one area to the other. So this is directly an outcome of research. Shifting gears, I will talk about a bird, um, the great Indian bustard, which almost became our national bird instead of the peacock. It was proposed by Dr. Salim Ali, but unfortunately the name, bustard, if it is mispronounced, it can have a huge connotation. And therefore this bird was not selected as the national bird of India. And today this bird is in drier states. There are less than 130 individuals surviving on this planet and a few populations in India. Just one actually in Rajasthan, in Jaisalmer, which has about 100 birds. The rest are two or three or four birds. In Maharashtra, there's a single female living in Sholapur. In Gujarat, there are three females living in Kutch. The primary reason for the decline of this bird has been collision with power lines. It's such a heavy bird that when it flies, it, it, it cannot see. And I've got a small film to show you on this, so I will not take much time. The film is self-explanatory. So what we have done is, as a policy against total extinction, as an insurance policy against total extinction, we have started a conservation breeding program where we harvest eggs from the wild, hatch them, and their progeny we hope to put back in the wild once the threats that caused their decline are addressed. So these birds are habituated and they'll be used for breeding.
Okay, I'll just show you this film which explains how we do this. Bustards are one of the heaviest flying birds and they have no frontal vision. So when they fly, they do not expect barriers in the sky. And the modern power lines cause most of their deaths. As you can see, the bustard here has collided with the power line emanating from the windmills which are the source of green energy. Considering the declining population of the Great Indian Bustard, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change mandated the Wildlife Minister of India to commence a conservation breeding program as an insurance against total extinction of the Bustard in the wild. We are going to take you through the conservation breeding facility set up at SAM in the Desert National Park, a collaboration between the Government of Rajasthan and the Wildlife Minister of India and a temporary facility has a set up, been set up at the Sum Dunes. The old guard quarters at Sum were transformed into a conservation breeding center with the help of the International Fund for Hobara Conservation. Scientists from IFHC Abu Dhabi helped us in designing it and setting the conservation center up at Sum. The facility here includes an incubator for incubating eggs which are secured from the wild. Subsequently, there's a hatchery in which the, uh, the newborn chicks are kept, fed up to the age of about 10 months to about a year. The live feed facility is also maintained here. The area is made totally predator proof so that rodents or other carnivores like dogs and foxes cannot access the eggs or the chicks and we can rear them with utmost security. The process commences with the location of breeding females that are nesting. And this requires a lot of field effort. Our field teams are well equipped. We had trained experts from IFHC who assisted our teams in locating females on nests. The regular movement of females within a localized area and a center homing place allows us to determine whether the female is nesting or is just wandering around on our foraging trips. So our team was able to locate several nests and with the permission of the government of Rajasthan, we were able to secure nine eggs this season and put them in the incubator for hatching. We have almost had a 100% success rate till now and there are seven chicks which are born and reared in the conservation breeding sector at some. Once the egg is collected, it is cleaned and weighed. The transportation from the nest site to the center is done in a vehicle with a chick. The for incubator is maintained I'll, I'll just at stop a constant here. temperature and humidity. Um, since lack of time, I'll talk about uh, the latest thing. So we now have 20 birds in captivity and uh, hopefully next year they will start breeding and their chicks will be put back in the wild provided we have safe areas where these birds can live without power lines. The problem is the power lines. So we need at least about 300 to 400 square kilometer areas without power lines. The power lines have to be put underground so that these birds can survive. And that is a major tussle um, between power agencies, Ministry of Environment and uh, conservation needs of this bird. So um, recently, as you know, on the um, occasion of the, the birthday of the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Bhai Modi, um, the first cheetah were brought to India. And I'll talk a little about how, how this, was, this happened. So it is an effort which we've been working on since 2009, and it was fruitified this year under the uh, Modi government. So the cheetah, the name itself is of Sanskrit origin. And unfortunately, ironically, we lost the cheetah in 1947. The last three cheetahs were shot in Chhattisgarh, in Sal forests. But if you look at the history of cheetah in India, you see cave paintings, which are about 10 to 20,000 years old in Bhimbetka and in the Chhatrapuj Nala in Madhya Pradesh. So the Neolithic um, people, cave, cave dwellers at that point in time, knew the difference between a leopard and a cheetah. And you can see distinctly the body shape differences which come up in, in these cave paintings. Um, Mr. Divya Bhanu Singh wrote up a book known as The End of a Trail and he traced the history of cheetah in India and as you can see, these are all the hunting records of cheetah in India and you can see they range across the entire part of the subcontinent. These, this was the historical range of the animal and you can see how it ranged into India and into Africa. Currently, only 9% of its historical range is occupied by the animal. The rest is all gone. They've been made extinct. These are the countries in which cheetah has been made extinct by human actions. 
And bringing back the cheetah in India not only serves our purpose of redressing the actions that we have taken on this planet, but also serves to the global objective of conserving the cheetah. So whenever we bring in a large carnivore into an ecosystem, they have a cascading effect on the different trophic levels which they affect. And it acts as an umbrella species as well. So with the cheetah, these are the conspecifics of the cheetah, the caracal, which is less than 100 animals in this country, the Indian wolf, the striped hyena, the Indian fox, the lesser florican and the great Indian bustards are sympatric. They live in the same habitats as the cheetah. So by conserving the cheetah, we create an umbrella which protects the entire biota. The threats that cause the extinction have been abated in our country. Today we have the economics, the science, and the political will to bring back this animal. So that's the idea of bringing it back. The first site in which we plan to reintroduce, the, we have reintroduced the cheetah is in Kuno National Park in the state of Madhya Pradesh. This is a 750 square kilometer human free national park embedded in a landscape which has good habitat for the cheetah of about 5,000 square kilometers. So there is enough space for the cheetah here. And there are many aspects which we need to consider before we bring in the animal. The most important is disease aspects, which will be familiar to you. Because when you bring in animals from Africa, just like you know, we had a lockdown for COVID, these animals can bring in novel pathogens into our country, which our carnivores and our wildlife is not exposed to. And that would cause catastrophic problems of epidemics possibly in our country. So we need to avoid that. So we screen these animals for diseases. There's a disease risk assessment uh, done, um, and that is a published document. After that, after screening for diseases, we vaccinate them for diseases in India because they have no immunity against the diseases present in our country. So this has to be done, and there's a quarantine of one month in Africa and a quarantine of one month in India before that is done. Other concern is that conflict with humans. When you bring in a large carnivore, living with people can be very difficult. And the cheetah is one of the best carnivores to have in your neighborhood if you are going to have a carnivore because there's not a single record of a wild cheetah killing a human being. So these people in this landscape have been living with tigers and leopards. Having a cheetah with them is going to be a piece of cake. Also, the cheetah, when the prime minister released the cheetah, the gates were open, the land prices, the real estate around this area escalated hundredfold. The price of land, which was 20,000 rupees a bigger, became 25 lakhs per bigger. So people have become rich overnight. And when communities profit from a conservation action, they are likely to support it. They know that it is because of this animal that we are rich today. And if we kill it, we are going to be in trouble. So I'll go to the process of how we did this. And you can see some of the glimpses of um, um, the cheetah. Uh, we, you know, and I'll, I'll just show you some, uh, a little bit of a documentation. So the cheetah were captured in uh, Namibia uh, and South Africa by helicopter, crated, uh, given a anti-anxiety tranquilizer so that when they are transported in this beautiful plane with the shape of a, with the face of a tiger, they are not stressed. An MOU was signed with the government of Namibia. That's the vice, pres uh, vice uh, deputy prime minister of Namibia and our minister of environment. We had cheetahs brought in by helicopter, army, air force uh, helicopters, and in these crates, and then they were put into quarantine bomas. The prime minister, uh, released the first three animals on Indian soil after 70 years of their extinction. The cheetah has been a major evolutionary force in the subcontinent. The speed of the black buck and the chinkara are shaped by this species. Bringing back a large carnivore at the apex of the trophic level results in a cascading effect in the ecosystem. This has been eliminated by human actions. And today, we witness a bringing back of this evolutionary force. Hopefully cheetahs like these two and many others from Southern Africa will help establish viable populations in India in many of the reserves that we have. The threats that resulted in their extinction have been abated in our country now. We have created habitat which is suitable for these animals. The prey base is there, the legal system is in place and the political will is also there. Lastly, I'd like to say that the fate of biodiversity is not in the hands of scientists, conservation, or managers, but on how society views and values it, what it is willing to pay, and how it motivates the political will to conserve it. 
So here you see the Prime Minister releasing one of my authored reports on the status of tigers. And I think today the political will is there. We need to make the most of it and make conservation happen. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, support from all these people, mostly my graduate students, who have worked tirelessly to collect information and make this happen. Funding sources, the institute where I come from, and I worked for 30 years, the Wildlife Institute of India, and I thank the organizers of uh, WERCO for um, calling me here and inviting me. Thank you so much.